kada su tako velika pomeranja u svetu i kada svako ima neke svoje interese, kada je već u pitanju i interes blokova, ko se sa kim slaže, ko koje mišljenje ima, vrlo je teško doći do osoba koji odnos sila prate dug i dugi niz godina. I zato sam ovdje došla kod gospodina Jonathana Ayla, koga dosta dugo znam i koji je uvek davao jako dobre procene, bar što se tiče dela sveta u kome mi živimo. Došla sam danas da sa njim razgovaram i postavim mu nekoliko pitanja. Ovo je taj Kraljevski institut. Ovde dolaze oni koji žele da saznaju kako da se ponašaju u određenim kritičnim situacijama u svetu. Ovde se ne stručnjaci koja svoje znanja baziraju na istoriji, na obaveštajnim podacima, na onome što mediji izveštavaju i nalaze balans istine i laži. Da li smo ovde došli po istinu, došli smo po istinu i po neki savjet, šta je ono što se događa trenutno u svetu, kolika je zaoštrenost među blokovima i čekamo Jonathan Ayla. Evo, oteto vreme od gospodina Jonathan Ayla i moje prvo pitanje je Šta je ono što ga prvo pitaju? When they come to you, Mr. Isle, what are they asking you first with the situation now? What is the question they come to you? The main question now is when is the war in Europe going to be over? When is the war in Ukraine over? That is the key question that I kept on being asked by diplomats, by politicians and by journalists. And the simple answer is it's almost impossible to answer that question. But I know from certain sources that everybody was thinking it's going to last maybe two, three weeks, it's going to be just a happening and it's going to be over. You are the only one who said, no, it's not going to be over. Well, it was obvious. I mean, it's understandable why people made a mistake. We had quite a lot of intelligence information about what the Russians were planning in, uh, in Ukraine. But it was impossible for anyone to assume, and a lot of people refused to believe it, because it looked so weird, it looked so lacking in logic, it looked like the kind of thing that it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be allowed to continue. What was very clear, however, is that this would be a very long fight. Let's be honest about it. What we are seeing now is the fight for the conclusion of the Cold War. A lot of the elements that have not been answered when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 are being answered now. So in many respects it's got some parallels to the tragedies of Yugoslavia in the early 1990s. Yugoslavia was the beginning of the answer to the questions of the end of the Cold War. And the war in Ukraine now is the most acute. You know that uh, my country, Serbia, is uh, very much pushed to take the sanctions toward Russia. And there is a certain hesitation. It's uh, they don't do it. And uh, on the other side, we want to be the member of European Union, right? And uh, the situation is uh, the people hardly can accept that because the soul is, you know, Russian soul, and as you know, the closeness between our two countries is very, very emotional. So if you would sit somewhere thinking independently, because it doesn't matter where you sit, doesn't matter that you are here, your opinion is always valued as a real independent professional opinion. What you would tell me? Well, looking from outside, I must admit, I think I would suggest that the 
affinity or the friendship or the historic gratitude between Russia and Serbia is, as we all know, not a hundred percent and the picture is not only in one direction. Um, I can give plenty of examples where the Russians historically were on the side of Serbia, but I can also give you plenty of examples where the Russians were not on the side of Serbia uh, on a variety of issues, uh, especially the border with Bulgaria, especially the questions of Macedonia, especially even the questions at the beginning, immediately after the Second World War, were of course for decades after the Second World War, all Yugoslav, all the people of Yugoslavia were fearing a Soviet uh, invasion of their country. So I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to say that uh, all the eyes are on Moscow and the uh, bonds of friendship are completely unbroken. Where I think Serbian leaders and politicians may be right is that the demands on Serbia to impose sanctions on Russia may be correct, I would support them, but at the same time it's obvious that Serbia is asked to do certain things but is not being offered a great deal. Uh, the European integration prospects, for instance, remain as distant as possible. Uh, so I would be, if I was a Serbian politician, I would also ask myself the same question. Yes, I am European. Yes, I am against the use of violence in Europe. Yes, I am against the change of borders by force. But if these principles apply to the rest of Europe, they also apply to Serbia. And if uh, the rest of Europe expects security, uh, joint security cooperation, so does Serbia. So I think that a lot of the discussion about Serbia's place in the Ukraine war has been very one-sided about what Serbia can do or should do rather than also trying to answer the other side of the coin, which is what the rest of Europe should do or could do for Serbian security as well. So, to suggest that Serbia, for instance, should not uh, benefit from Russian energy supplies without offering any alternative is not particularly clever and it's not likely to work. Again, I'm not justifying the Serbian position necessarily. There could be many ways of explaining this one. I'm merely trying to understand it. When you are, you are taking certain decisions and when you are advising many skilled diplomats, that you extremely pay attention to the personalities. I mean, I think that if we look at the leaders of Serbia today and especially at the president, I think I'm less impressed by accusations that he served in a Milosevic government uh, in some capacity or another. I don't think that's very relevant. I think in many respects he has adjusted to the situation of the world uh, today. Uh, probably earlier than many other leaders in the countries that used to be communist probably much earlier than many other leaders, he understood uh, that the question of Russia will remain a very important one. The influence of Russia in Central Europe and Eastern Europe it will remain a key question that needs to be answered. Uh, and that the security structure that was on offer immediately after the end of the Cold War in which only NATO and the European Union were the only alternatives, 
may be correct but may not be the only answer for the security of Serbia itself until the territorial questions, until the questions of relationship with the neighbours are, uh, are properly resolved. So, in many respects, I suspect that the leaders of Serbia after the fall of Milosevic uh, were much more realistic about the situation of their country. And I accept all the criticism about the position on Kosovo, uh, whether the position on Kosovo is sustainable or not sustainable in the long term. But what I look much more is that at their approach to European security arrangements as a whole, where I think that there was perhaps more realism in Belgrade than people assume. Mr. Ayo, is Mr. Putin going to push the button? Before you sleep, are you thinking about it? Well, when the story of the potential use of nuclear weapons first started going around, I tended to dismiss it as an irrelevance, as just a bit of uh, frightening uh, talk. I think one needs to look at it much more seriously now for a variety of reasons. Um, the first one is that I do not see Mr. Putin simply accepting defeat in Ukraine and saying, oh well, I tried, it didn't work, now I go home. Uh, I don't think that people like Putin uh, behave in, in this way. Number two, I think there was too much of a rather careless discussion in the West about defeating Russia. I always ask people, what does it mean to defeat a nuclear power? <laughs> what exactly does it mean? Do you assume that the nuclear power will take the defeat and just go away? Well, we have some examples. The United States was defeated in, uh, in uh, Vietnam uh, and it didn't use nuclear weapons. The Russians were defeated in, in Afghanistan and they didn't use nuclear weapons. So you could say that you could defeat the nuclear power in a war and go away. But the problem is that this is very much seen in Moscow as a war that goes to the heart of Russia's security concerns in Europe. And although Mr. Putin has uh, apparently still a very significant political control in Moscow, I am not sure he can survive a war which ends up with nothing for him and probably a hundred thousand dead soldiers, which is what it will be by the end of this, of this fighting. So I think that there is an element of desperation in Moscow and as we now know from American intelligence sources over the last few days, we do know that there were serious discussions in the Russian military about the possibility of using a nuclear weapon just in order to tell the Ukrainians and the West that Russia has a red line and that it will, the West is not allowed to cross that red line. So if you ask me in simple terms, do I fear a nuclear exchange? I think the answer is still probably not. But I would say there is still about a 20% possibility of the use of nuclear uh, weapons, uh, which is a very big possibility if we think about it in historic terms. We have not been in such a situation where nuclear weapons are being discussed in a very serious way as a possibility to be used since the Cuban crisis uh, which accidentally we are commemorating 60 years uh, just as we speak now. Uh, so it is a very, very tense situation and there's a very big question for Western governments how far we are prepared to push the Russians uh, on, this, uh, on this situation. I understand all the difficulties of betraying Ukraine or of telling Ukraine to accept to lose territory just so that 
Russia doesn't appear to be 100% humiliated. So I understand the difficulties with that. But I repeat, what does it mean to defeat a nuclear power on a question that they consider as essential to their security? If we can't find an answer to that question, uh, we are in difficulties. The people which are coming to you, they are decision makers. Do they understand you? Can they follow what they, you are telling them? We had in the British government structure two and a half people looking at Russia. Uh, one person who also, the third person, did only half the job uh, on, on Russia. That was the sum total of the experts at the top. So I think that there is an understanding now that we need to know more. And you also have a new generation of leaders who, quite frankly, have no idea of the Cold War. For them, the Cold War is something in the history books and have no idea, therefore, of the background to the story, the way the Russians think of the world, the way they see the world. They just simply don't get it. So I would say that people listen. Um, I'm, of course, not the only one who gives advice. There's other people that give advice as well. So people do listen. People are uh, prepared to hear uh, the arguments. Um, but there is also a public side to it, which is very difficult to uh, bring in. So, for instance, there is no Western government that has the courage to tell the Ukrainians to stop the fighting now, even if that's what they believed, because it's impossible. The Ukrainians have an enormous amount of credibility with the public at large. So there's no Western leader that would be prepared to do that, even if that's what they believed. Number two, uh, there is uh, the leading role of the United States in all of this. So I don't think that countries are going to be uh, prepared to uh, sort of do a different policy from that of the United States when it comes to this one. And number three, there is a deep feeling that this is a conflict where we have to make it very clear to the Russians that the aggression does not succeed. Um, I think we underestimate how many European leaders genuinely believe in that. That this is, uh, as people keep on saying, uh, like 1938 with Hitler marching into Austria and then into Czechoslovakia, that these are the kind of aggressions that you must not allow to succeed if you don't want a creation of a bigger problem in the future. So on the whole, I think people listen, but I would say that politicians, as always, have their own agendas and their own calculations, and therefore I shouldn't exaggerate the importance of people like me in providing them with advice. Tell me, what's going to happen with Serbia? How do you see my country? How we are going to come out of a problem which is evident? If you asked me the question about the future of Serbia, let's say a year ago, I would have been rather pessimistic. I would have seen that there was a, a sort of an entrenchment uh, of a problem over um, the Kosovo question, uh, coupled with effectively a failed state next door in the case of Bosnia, coupled with a fairly assertive Croatia that is unlikely to have been a long friend of, uh, uh, of uh, Serbia, and then of course some vulnerable neighbors in the neighborhood and the Russian role, let's not forget the Russian role played last year in, in Montenegro, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, northern Macedonia. So uh, there was a very active 
subversion activities of the Russians in the region. But I think the worst was the inability of the rest of Europe to think about the region of the Western Balkans as part of a European whole. The whole idea of inventing the concept of the Western Balkans was to pretend that this is somehow a separate part of Europe with a separate part of problems and a separate part of answers. So I was quite pessimistic about where this is going. There was a feeling that everything was stuck in one way or another. I am less pessimistic. In fact, I'm quite optimistic now, funny enough, despite the uh, war in Ukraine. I'm optimistic for a number of reasons. First, because the war in Ukraine has made it very clear that there is actually no chance of European security unless the region is incorporated into a pan-European security structure. Now, that doesn't mean to say everyone has to be a member of NATO. Not everyone is a member of NATO in the western part of the continent. It does not mean that everyone should be a member of the European Union, although in many respects that is still the standard as far as trade and inter-government relations. But it does mean that the solution has to be pan-European. So let's remember what has happened over the last few months. Uh, the positive side, if you want, of the war in Ukraine. First, there was an acceptance that a country like Ukraine, which nobody talked about before, could one day become a member of the European Union. Second, there was an, an acceptance that our policy on the Western Balkans was not going anywhere and needs to change. There was a lot of discussion before, the so-called Berlin process, all that sort of stuff. I think it's an acceptance now that these are all waste of time, that at the end of the day you can only stabilize the region by including it into pan-European structures. So I'm, I'm, I'm much more optimistic about it now and I think that the problems of the failed state like Bosnia or the problems of the very deep historic and problems of Kosovo, for instance, become less important if these countries are incorporated into a structure in which the borders are less important, the movement of people and goods is the key element and less the question of which side of the border you are. I'm more optimistic now than I was in the past. I'm more optimistic about commitment of Europeans to security. And I'm also more optimistic about Serbia itself if one looks at some of the inward investments that are coming into the country, um, including the, uh, if I can mention it, the diversification of energy resources which will have to come after the end of the war in Ukraine you would see places like Serbia being actually very well positioned for corridors of energy coming from the south uh, through the Balkans region and into the rest of Europe. Problems? There are hundreds. Uh, uh, difficulties with the politics in this region? Absolutely. But if you ask me about the future of these countries, I think I'm much more positive now than a year ago, paradoxically, in the middle of a European war. What do you call near, near future? I am referring to something between five to ten years from now. I don't think that the current situation in the so-called Western Balkans is sustainable for much longer because there's some long-term less, sorry, there's some fundamental changes that are likely to take place in Europe as a result of the war in Ukraine, even if the war in Ukraine stops today. There's some irreversible processes. So, for instance, the center of gravity in Europe has shifted to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, it's very obvious in this crisis that the influence of France and Germany, for instance, has been much lower than in the past, and especially the influence of Germany in Central Europe has been declining for many reasons. So it's a different kind of Europe now. It's a Europe that looks at matters in a different way. It's a Europe that is no longer 
decided in Paris or Berlin and orders come this way. It's a Europe that is genuinely much more interactive. Now, in a Europe like that, in which middle-sized countries have a bigger say, uh, Serbia could live very easily. Uh, that's not a bad position. So I would say five to ten years from now, of course, that may sound short-term for many people, or long-term, depends on your perspective. But on the whole, I would say I'm more optimistic now than I've been for two decades. You know what is interesting? You always gave the truth. You never gave promises. Mm. And another thing, you became more diplomat. You Did know? I? Yes. Well, I think you, you are milder now than you have been before. <laughs> You're very kind. I take it as a compliment because I think that immediately after the fall of communism and immediately after in the 1990s, there were a lot of people who used to think in black and white terms. And you either with us or you're against us. You either do this or you do that. And um, perhaps this was the age. It was a revolutionary age. Let's not forget that. It was an age when Europe was being transformed both from below and from above. There were two pressures going on at the same time, leaders and population. And so it was clearly a period when people, like always in revolutionary periods, people think in absolutist terms. This is the only truth, the only thing. I think what happened in Europe over the last 30 years or so is that you get used to the idea that there are no absolutes in this terms. I mean, if you look at the leadership, all the leaders in Belgrade since the collapse of uh, uh, Milosevic regime, so we're now two decades after that, all the leaders there at the end had to maneuver between a set of desirable outcomes and realistic outcomes. You know, they had to find the middle way. So I don't think I make an apology for being perhaps less passionate or less or more diplomatic than I was in the past. I think that it's partly a question of age, but it's also partly a question of new circumstances in, in, in Europe. I mean, we all know that it's shades of grey uh, and not always just black and white in a very clearly defined manner. <laughs> I'm glad that you tell me that somehow they listen to you more than before. Well, I think they listen. I mean, whether they have an influence, whether I have an influence, that's another story. Uh, I, 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 I always have to resist the temptation to think that I'm very important because, uh, well, because, because people, politicians have 101 reasons why they make a decision and they usually make a decision on many calculations, including their re-election prospects and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, you know, I think the key element is that they understand, sorry, they know what they don't know, if you see what I mean. They know that their knowledge of what goes to the mind of Putin is not good and that they can get any advice that they should get. So, for instance, one of the key elements, you know, the Americans had a very good sources of intelligence inside Russia about the Russian preparations for the war. The CIA was 100% correct. They even predicted the day that he was going to invade, and sure enough, he invaded on the day, on the 24th of February. So. Um, but the big resistance, and I saw it with my own eyes, is politicians who said, no, nah, cannot be. This is crazy. He can't be saying that. He's not going to do that. This is completely crazy. It's because they started from one assumption of their own perspective and their own experience. And they looked at it from that perception. And from that perception, it looked crazy. 
And so you said, okay, okay, the information is like this, but it cannot be. He's bluffing. He's not going to do anything because this is so cuckoo that he's not going to happen. And of course, the most cuckoo thing happens. And it doesn't happen because Putin is crazy. It happens because there is a certain mentality in Moscow that pushed them in that direction. And it's that mentality that you have to understand. And if you don't understand it, you come to wrong conclusions. So I think they did this, they understood, because they came to the wrong conclusions at the beginning, and then they understood. And so in that way, yes, they listened. But does it mean that I have an input into decision making? That's a different question. Now, one domestic question. Uh -huh. Have you been surprised right. with the new situation with Downing Street 10, this movement? Oh. oh, you mean with all the appointments and things? Yes, I have been. Uh, because I somehow believe that British politics are immune to uh, the sort of things. I know, it's perhaps a bit of a racist thing, or you get, just get used to because it's your country, so you get used to it. So. You always think, oh, well, our country is different. It's not like Italy, or I don't know what, France or whatever, Serbia. Uh, so n not with us. I was surprised, yes. I was surprised at the low level of uh, politicians, at the low level of experience. And I'm surprised. I mean, I knew her when she was foreign secretary. She wasn't for a long time foreign secretary. And I must admit, I was completely unimpressed by her. This is Liz Truss, when, mm -hmm. when, when, when she was foreign secretary, because she didn't look to me at all as a person in charge of her file or knowing what she's doing. But I was completely stunned when she became uh, prime minister. And even more stunned that you would have a prime minister who manages to discredit herself within 30 days. I mean, this is amazing. 44. 44 days, forgive me. But <laughs> it's, uh, you know, this is, this is amazing. I mean, I feel sorry for her because, you know, deep down you must know that you fought so hard to get to the top. You finally made it to the top and you were proven to be unworthy or incapable of keeping that position. So yes, I'm surprised. I think that with the current leader we are returning to a more traditional way. I mean, of course, he's not a traditional British politician in a traditional sense, but he is in other sense. He's cautious, he listens to what people say, he's not into bullshit, he doesn't lie. But I think in a way, the problem for all of us is that we always assume that these are special cases and we don't, because we live in the middle of it, we don't look at the trends. And there's two very important things that both relate to the same thing. It applies to your country, it applies to all our countries, all European countries, which is political mobilization is now done in a very different way than the way it was done in the past. So to give you an example, in the case of Britain, uh, the political mobilization was at election times and it was very old-fashioned. You go, you listen to politicians talking, you get some politicians in the middle of a street starting with a megaphone to say, vote for me because I'm mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You get someone putting a leaflet through mm -hmm. your letterbox saying, vote for Labour or vote for Conservative because we're going to do one, two, three, four. You sit in front of television in the evening and you listen to a debate between politicians and you start thinking, I like him, I like her, or stuff like that. Fine. That's all gone. I mean, you get now bits, you get thousands of bits of information. You're bombarded from Twitter, from clips, on your mobile phone, a headline, you know, that kind of stuff which means that small matters that don't matter suddenly become big matters. So you suddenly read, I don't know, Liz Truss fell off the chair in a studio and broke her ankle, you know, and that becomes the, the real story. And everyone says, oh, we have, we have heard Liz, Liz Truss broke her ankle, you know, which is completely irrelevant in political terms, but all these things now matter. Or you get people that uh, just write tweets and think that they've changed policy because they were writing a tweet. So, 
the engagement is different. In the past, political parties used to be, in Britain, political parties used to have millions of members. In 1980, the Conservative Party had 1.8 billion members. Now, if you look at the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds in Britain, it has more members than all the British political parties put together. The Conservative Party has 160,000 members. But what is interesting is well, when the Conservative Party was 1.6 million members, the leader of the party was elected by the members of Parliament, not by the members of the party. Now that it has 160,000 members, the leader of the party is elected by a vote of the members of the party, because these parties are desperate to appear to be more democratic. The result is that you get freaks, because the people who elect them are also freaks. So how many people do you know that spend money to become a member of a political party and go to meetings now? I know of no one. All my friends that I, I know, I mean, they have political views, but they don't go to pay for subscription to be a member of a political party or to go to a meeting. So the ones who do are very unrepresentative of the public. So are you surprised that you end up with people like um, Liz Truss or Jeremy Corbyn for the Labour Party, the same thing. These are unelectable people, but they are there because they were elected by a small group of people who don't represent anyone. And then you get people like Donald Trump or like Boris Johnson in Britain. You get people who make up uh, stories because you know if you if you if you are put in an unpleasant situation or a difficult situation you just make up a story for me uh -huh. who knows britain mm -hmm. the pound everything is 100 percent sure mm -hmm. everything is okay do you think that all this story that there is no money that everything is disaster that britain is collapsing could be a strategy. Have you been thinking? Came to my mind. What do you mean a strategy? A strategy? That is not true. Well. Did you believe it? No, I don't believe it. So for instance, to give you an example, uh, the budget of Liz, Liz Trust, the one that created the economic collapse on the markets and destroyed her reputation. Uh, basically, she was proposing to borrow 18 billion pounds, extra borrowing of 18 billion pounds. Now, to tell me that if Britain was borrowing another 18 billion pounds, it would be bankrupt uh, is, is nonsense. But the problem is with many countries, it's a problem of reputation. And Serbia uh, remembers it very well from the 1990s. The problem is not the truth very often. The problem is one of reputation. And as you say, there was a reputation in the case of the UK that the UK was a predictable country where nothing uh, radical is being done, where politicians stay for a long time, where governments, once they get elected, they stay for five years, and where you have only two political parties that alternate in power. All this was, uh, was there. Uh, and so and all of a sudden, all this is not there. We've had three prime ministers this year. And you, so it's a, it's a question of reputation as well, very often. Uh, and we are suffering on the subject of reputation at the moment. There is a feeling that the parties are not doing, both political parties don't have the caliber of people to run a country in a proper way. There is also the question of Brexit, the leaving of the European Union. And uh, it's, um, it's, really, it's really difficult to be sure how much it impacted on Britain. But I think there is growing evidence that it has had an impact. And the most important impact, funny enough, is not the economic one. The most important impact is one on the role and the place of Britain in, in the world. And on that, there has been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, but not a very clear answer. There is, 
this dream that we are going to be part of a big world, that uh, you know you're going to get closer to Australia in the United States, that you'll have plenty of trade there, that there's a whole world outside Europe. It's all very true, but in a way it's a bit irrelevant because at the end of the day we still remain next door to Europe and we still have, in terms of outlook, culture and everything else, we remain a European country. So there is a crisis of identity and there is a crisis of political credibility. So I agree with you that a lot of these discussions about Britain being finished and the pound sterling being finished and the economy gone, well, we're still one of the six top economies in the world, which is not uh, a bad position to be in. But uh, I would say that the crisis feeling of a crisis is real enough.